So, welcome to the University of Orange and in residence at the Queen's Museum as part of reviewing renewal. Um, this is our last full Sunday, six hours of programming uh, for this residency. Next week there'll be a program from three to four where I will try to sum up where we've been for the last four weeks and then we'll have a little closing reception where you can you know, eat some things and drink some things and talk about them all. So please come back. Um, but as this is our last moment like this, I thought I'd take a risk um, and ask the person who I just noticed in the audience who's been here for the whole day, which is pretty awesome, uh, to do this last introduction because I know it won't scare any of you off because you don't have the opportunity again to do what David's done, which is show up at noon and experience an entire day of, of reviewing renewal programs. So he's going to give you a little bit of a summary of where he's been today. Good afternoon. Um, let's see, what have I seen so far? So uh, the beginning of the day started out with a movie called The Rink, uh, which dealt with essentially a roller skating rink located in Newark, New Jersey. Um, part of the reason that I wanted to attend that is because I'm originally from New Jersey. I actually grew up in a town next to New York. Uh, presently, I'm a resident actually of uh, the Rockaways. Um, so I'm actually involved with some of the community and that's kind of actually, I met Paula prior to that, but somewhat involved with that as well. Um, Arbor East uh, development that's going on that you would have seen if you went to the last and most recent um, <laughs> presentation, uh, which was just down the panorama, which I had the opportunity to see as well. Um, and now we're moving on to the University of Orange. And just prior to that, uh, who was the, who was the last Rich. panelist? He's right here. Dean yes. Rich. Who was this, but who was the panelist before them? That was, that was, uh, Oh, before that we have, so we were here with, uh, with uh, Lower East Side. Uh, with good old Lower East Side, talking about Spurra. Spurra, thank you. The Seward That's Park it. Urban Renewal Area. Yes. Yeah. So there was that as well. So there's been a lot of amazing things that I've been able to see. This was the first time I actually got the chance to attend. Uh, so I wanted to take advantage of uh, seeing everything throughout the full day. And also because it's dealing with areas that are dear to me, uh, personally. Um, and that's about it. So I hope you guys enjoy. And tomorrow, what, next Saturday, Sunday is the last day? So come back next time. <laughs> Hi everyone. Let me know like this if I need to speak louder. I'm not well acquainted with microphones. Point it right at my mouth. Okay, great. Um, so welcome. I want to introduce our panel really quickly. We have Rod Wallace. Um, you'll hear more about each of our panelists as we go through. Um, we have Havana Fisher, Molly Thompson Fully Love, Mindy Thompson Fully Love. <laughs> Classic mistake. <laughs> And I'm Molly Kaufman, who is my fellow moderator and the provost of the University of Orange. I'm Aubrey Murdoch, and I'm the academic dean of the University of Orange. Um, and uh, in wanting to introduce why we wanted to situate renewal within sort of the lineage that includes redlining and gentrification, I want to start by introducing the University of Orange. So we're a free people's university based out of Orange, New Jersey, also close to Newark. Um, and as a free school, we do things like offer courses taught by volunteers, including like harmonica class and beer making, but we also offer urbanism programs. Um, and our urbanism work is based on the premise that American cities have been, as Mindy writes, sorted out. Um, and so this means that we understand that policies such as redlining, segregation, urban renewal have created lasting fractures in our cities and have deeply affected the social structure and the everyday lives of communities and particularly communities of color. Um, and to understand this more deeply, we look to the city that we work in. So we use Orange as our schoolhouse um, and practice place-based work that combines historical exploration, including recording oral histories um, and methods of learning together, um, which includes the rich tradition encompassed by popular education. Which brings me to this January. Every January at University of Orange we have a Jan term. And actually, in the back, she was just here. Michelle was at the very first Jan term. So that's really cool. I don't know if Michelle was. Anyway, okay. Um, <laughs> um, 
So anyways, every, every Jan term we have a session that includes a seminar, a volunteer opportunity, and a field trip. And we believe that this combination of learning, doing, and engaging really embodies what we think that an urbanism practice should involve. Um, and so this January, our theme was Popular Education and the Just City. Um, and that featured a seminar led by our colleague and very wonderful friend, Robert Simber, um, and a trip to the National Archives to scan redlining maps and area descriptions, including this map here of Queens, where we are at now. Um, and Molly and Mindy will both speak a little bit more about that, I believe. Um, and so, from this Jan term, uh, which this panel is the culmination uh, at the end of Jan term, we've learned the importance of understanding ourselves within a historical context, um, understanding that our present is shaped by structures that rely on inequity to function, and we've also learned the importance of bringing this knowledge into a dialogue, and so we hope that this panel can be the beginning of a dialogue and discussion and engagement that spans even outside of the museum. So, I'm really excited. I hope you are too. Thank you, Aubrey. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Molly, and as Aubrey said, I'm the provost of the University of Orange. Can, can everyone hear in the back? Yes. Okay, awesome. So, welcome to the University of Orange. Uh, what Aubrey didn't mention is that to graduate from the University of Orange, you must take two classes offered by the University of Orange. Vote in any election, it doesn't have to be formal. Volunteer, attend a city meeting, and have fun with your neighbors. So, we just want you to know that this will count as a course towards your graduation requirements. And we have graduation in June, on, on or on the Saturday before Juneteenth. So, as Aubrey mentioned, we were collectively very inspired and also honored to be asked by Paula and 596 Acres to be part of the programming, which we think you guys are doing such a fantastic job. And we were really inspired uh, and grateful to have the opportunity to share with you all the way that we understand urban renewal and top-down planning projects in a continuum of projects and policies that have systematically undermined communities. And we hope that the analysis that we're gonna present to you will be able to inform your organizing work and your activism work because this is really the basis from which our work at the University of Orange grows. So we're going to watch a movie, but before that, I just wanted to share something else with you that informs my own community organizing and activism, which is that I learned, as many of you probably also did, on social media or Google this morning that it's Langston Hughes' birthday. I don't know if anyone saw the little <laughs> Google video. But anyway, so then that made me think of the postscript, the postscript to a book that my grandmother Maggie wrote. And I have it here, and it's called From One to 91 A Life by Maggie Thompson. And she was a lifelong activist and organizer, and she wrote this memoir at the age of 91. And so here's her postscript, and uh, so this also, uh, her work and my grandfather's work informs our organizing work in Orange every day, and as Rod and I were discussing before this panel, it is our sincere wish that when you hear all of these facts presented, you don't put your head between your legs and feel depressed. You think of this as tools to help you organize. And so here's the message from my grandmother. I was only a child in the lower grades when I learned that there are white people who don't like to see other white people be friends with black people. Thus, almost before I could read, I was thrown in to what Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois called the problem of the 20th century, the color problem. This lesson was brought home to me again when I was in college. That time, I was old enough to begin to understand it, believe it was wrong, and wish I could learn to do something about it. When I finished college, I went south to learn. 
At the end of my life, I am grateful that early on, I came face to face with the big issue of my time, one that still faces our country and the world even now in the 21st century. Not to be a part of that struggle is to miss life's greatest challenge. Seek it out and do your best. Langston Hughes, in a few words, brilliantly summarized my credo. Not me alone, but all the whole oppressed must put their hands with mine to shake the pillars of those temples wherein the rule of greed's upheld. That must be ended. Woo! Woo! <laughs> so, that's our message from Maggie. And from there, we're going to watch a film called Urban Renewal is People Removal, which is about urban renewal in Newark, New Jersey. It was written and produced by Mindy Fully Love and Sarah Booth. And, um, it came out to coincide with the book Bootshop, How Tearing Up City Neighborhoods Hurts America and What You Can Do About It, by Dr. Philly Love, also Maggie's daughter. <laughs> so, I think we're gonna come around to it. Okay. <laughs> Someone needs to hit play. Dr. Mindy Thompson, Philly Love. <laughs> this name I said correctly this time. It's always been my fear, as long as I've known both of you, that I would accept the name. So I'm super glad it happened in front of all 125 of us. <laughs> um, and it was my great pleasure to meet Mindy. She was my advisor for my thesis um, in the Design and Urban Ecologies program at Parsons. And I think really gave our program a lot of substance. Um, and then invited me to come work at University of Orange, which was one of the best things ever. So thank you. Our, our Jan term this year, we took a field trip to the National Archives in College Park, Maryland, because we were interested in, in helping out a, a really massive project that's looking at how to get these maps um, accessible into the hands of ordinary people so that we can understand this part of this larger story of repeated upheaval. As Richard Camreri mentioned in the film, redlining made it really difficult for people in poor neighborhoods to get uh, mortgages, to get insurance. So that's what it looks like. Well, they all look like more or less like that. That's a redlining map of my hometown, Orange, New Jersey, where the University of Orange is located. And the point is that there's no one line around some neighborhoods. The whole city is graded and then given a, every section is given a rating and there are four ratings maybe this thing has yeah so you can see the four ratings so a is the first grade b is the second grade c is the third grade d is the fourth grade so the red place it's a red place it's not a red line the red place was basically where the undesirable racial elements lived which would be black people, Hispanic people, Asian people, Jewish people, immigrants, a lot of people. Italians, <laughs> Polish. Exactly, Italians, Polish. So the, the green, that's for the white people who had new houses. So if you were, and then if you were like not as wealthy, you had a slightly smaller house, you got blue. Um, but if you were black, you got red. This is like, so in orange, this was the black ghetto, and then this was where the Italians lived. So it was yellow, like a notch up. But you see how it's, it's, not, it's not a line at all. So, so the thing is, the, the unanswered question is, well, what did this do to the United States of America? So they went out in the 1930s. The idea was that the banks were in trouble, and they wanted to tell the banks where to invest their money so that they would be protected, investments would be protected. And the real message was, don't put it here, because that's, I don't know, undesirable racial elements. You don't want to put your money where there are undesirable racial elements. You want to put your money over here. And so part of this opening up the suburbs, suburban development, is that 
look at the amount of surface area in Orange, New Jersey that's not appropriate for development. It's almost the whole city. And when you look at these maps, you see time after time after time that most of the land in the whole city, whatever city you're looking at, is red or yellow, not green or blue. Green or blue is out in the suburban areas. So this huge pressure that where you wanted to put your money, what was going to be grade A investment, was not in the cities. Now, there are 200 or so of these maps, and they have not been digitized, which is a reasonably trivial project in this day and age. I mean, Google is digitizing like the whole world, every book that was ever written. Uh, but these maps have not, and the supporting documents have yet to be digitized. So Richard Marciano and colleagues at a number of universities are beginning a project to get this work done. And our field trip was to be part of that effort. It's a massive body of data um, because it includes not only the, the maps, but also the supporting documents. Something changed. I moved a little bit. Technology. So they, they did analysis, some analysis of this data. And this is Orange, New Jersey. And it says, this is a very old city of restricted area and practically complete development. A large portion of its population is farm-born and Negro, and part of its area can properly be classed as slum. Outside of its proximity to beautiful parks, reservations, and convenience to both Newark and New York City, it has far less to commend it than any of the other oranges. So they're basically writing off the city, um, which any rational process of saying, where should we put money, where should we be, if you understood cities as engines of civilization, you would be saying, oh, that's an area that's going to need investment over the next 50 years. It's not going to need disinvestment. But quite the opposite logic is at work here. So this is the redlining map of Manhattan from 1937. This is 155th Street, so this is basically Harlem, and this is basically Washington Heights. So this is an aerial photo, a slightly later period of time, but just to compare. Uh, and the redlining maps of, of New York City are all online as part of Richard Marciano's, uh, this digitizing redlining. What they don't have um, are the um, area descriptions, which we copied and hope to contribute to their project, so they should be online soon. The area descriptions are very important because that's where they write down and where you can see the logic of racism. The, you know, sort of in the documents of slavery and in the documents of redlining are the two places where you can see the actual articulation of what is American racism. That's why it's so urgent that all of these documents are put online. So this is what they had to say about a, a good area that's rated A. So it has hilly terrain, all city facilities, um, white collar, look how much money. That's, I guess that's a lot of money. No foreign families, Negro, no. So that, that gets an A. Now notice they don't have to say white people, oh, right? Or so linguists talk about language that is marked and language that is unmarked. So it, it, the thing that you don't have to say is the thing that's the highest class. So the thing you have to say, like like if you just say people, that means good white people. Mostly if, like, if black people or Hispanic people say people, they mean black people or Hispanic people. Asian people, same way. So if they want to say, if a, like me, if I'm saying people, I'm meaning black people. If I want to say white people, I would say white people. <laughs> it's just true. <laughs> this is science. <laughs> so, they, there are, these are people, right? And then they have to go through the, the lower grade, right? The undesirable, not even people, undesirable racial elements is the language that you find popping up in this thing. But look at this. Favorable influences, detrimental influences. So this one was, uh, got a slightly, wait, really? this one got a slightly lower rating. So all city facilities, facing Highbridge Park, substantial age. Now look, this is a detrimental influence. Infiltration of less desirable inhabitants. I mean, the language is utterly brutal. 
But this is the language we have to understand, is this is the language and this is the thinking that drove the money that shaped the city, and still does. Notice, foreign-born families nominal, Negro few. So this gets a B. This is the next one. All city facilities, good transportation, detrimental influences, age and obsolescence. Um, trend of desirability down. And then this one has labor mix and Negro, yes, 90%. That's obviously a D. So that's a description of Harlem. But this, too, is a description of Harlem. This is a photograph by Sid Grossman, which was taken in the, exactly the same time period. Um, he was a member of a, a New York photography club. And some of you may have seen an amazing exhibit a couple years ago at the Jewish Museum called Radical Camera. Uh, so he was a, a pillar of that photography group. And they loved to go around the neighborhoods and take pictures of what was going on. And what you can see in the photographs is life. Like, people were poor, but they had life together. They had a way of living that was affirming, that was developing, that was community. But that is rated by the United States government as just undesirable racial elements and going downhill. So this is the struggle. This is the struggle to affirm that this is what we want to be looking for when and describing when we are rating neighborhoods and we want cities that go into neighborhoods that are full of life and that ask the question, how can we help? We know you're planning to stay. How can we help? What do you need? It, this is really what we're trying to get at. We have to turn the whole system on its head. So this is Harlem in 1990 as a result of all the policies, and Rod's going to talk some more about the policies that resulted, that took us from here to here. Won't go. Doesn't even want to go there. <laughs> The, the reason this is so important to me as a physician is that this is when the city is producing health and it's capable of producing health. And this is when the city is producing disease and it's not capable of producing health. So it's urgently important that we change these policies. Highbridge Park, you may remember that one of the sections was looking at Highbridge Park and Molly and I were um, exploring with Joseph Sanchez and Lourdes Hernandez Cordero Rodriguez. Um, and Highbridge Park had basically been abandoned at that time, largely because these same policies of writing off neighborhoods also write off sections of parks. There's been a lot of attention lately to the problems of parks inequity, and Highbridge was certainly one of the parks that suffered from inequity. It was huge fun to go exploring in Highbridge because there was nobody there, but that's not what parks are for, for my amusement. You know, my personal you know, intrepid exploring party to have fun being all by ourselves in the middle of New York City. We want this to be useful for everyone. So our, our, my research team and uh, many of our friends have been part of a project called Climb City Life is Moving Bodies, which has been trying to make a hiking trail from Central Park to the Cloisters and advocate for investment in these parks. This is our original trail map. Um, and every year we have a big party on the first Saturday in June. You're all invited. It's a great fun. Held at Highbridge Park, and it's called Hike the Heights. We'll be celebrating Hike the Heights 11 this year. Um, and that's Molly leading a bunch of kids from Harlem Children's Zone um, who had just come through Highbridge Forest and had a blast um, looking for snakes. <laughs> <laughs> because the parks kind of make a shape of a giraffe, uh, every year, kids make paper mache giraffes to celebrate the parks. And it's really important because you have to, it's in some way, start to say these are places of value. And so these paper mache giraffes were part of just of, of reclaiming and reasserting, reasserting the goodness of these places in the face of this sort of official denigration and abandonment. So this is high, these are some stairs in Highbridge Park in 2005 and the same stairs in 2011. And um, as Rod likes to say, our big challenge now is gentrification. And the question that's hovering over us is, who will walk these stairs in years to come? Um, as we were, uh, we had some planners helping us think about our trail and our path. And we made this beautiful one there. 
So anyway, we wanted to put it on the map, so we did. We made a beautiful map. And that was our symbol for Hike the Heights 10. And this is just a, a rock with love on it that is in Highbridge Park. This, it is about love in these places that have been officially written off. It was wrong to write them off because they didn't see the love. And there is still love there despite all the difficulties. And they're still trying to drive the people out and drive the love out. And this will kill us all. So um, I think we warned you that this might be depressing, but it's going to get worse before it gets better. <laughs> Turn it over to you, Rob. Epidemiology at the New York State Psychiatric Institute. Like Mindy, I am a past recipient of an investigator award in health policy research from the Rutherford Johnson Foundation, and that's no small thing. <laughs> what you have seen in the film is a case history of the serial forced displacement of minority populations in Newark. New York City, we do things a little bigger. <laughs> but there's a context for what I'm going to tell you. The first context is you must remember in the history of the United States, the abolitionist movement was successful in many respects. The urban reform movement at the end of the 19th and in the early 20th centuries was successful in many respects. The labor movement that came together with the urban reform movement was successful in many respects and those two movements together had a synergistic effect on people's length of life. The worst infectious diseases like tuberculosis, Jewish asthma, collapsed under the influence of improvement in working conditions in the early parts of the 20th century. The civil rights movement of the, of, of the 1950s and, uh, and 1960s was in large measure successful. There is a history there is a strain of history in the United States, the people's history, that stands in opposition to redlining, urban renewal, planned shrinkage. But to make the next step, it is important to understand how we came where we are, where we are now. You saw the story for Newark. If you go to figure one of the, the paper, you'll see a graph that shows an index, a citywide index of fire damage from 1959 in, into the 1980s. Is a political context for that. In 1967, by, or I'll, let me start a little earlier. By 1960, urban renewal was tagged as Negro removal. And urban renewal was stopped in large measure. It continued in Newark, it did not continue in New York City. In New York City, it was stopped as Negro removal. By 1967, Martin Luther King <coughs> began moving north. The Civil Rights Movement began looking at the system of American apartheid in the north. By 1970, the barbarians were at the gate. There were black mayors in Detroit, Cleveland, and Newark. In 1969, the barbarians were within the gates. 
Remember, Batillo made a credible run for mayor from a power base in the South Bronx. By 1970, two strains had come together among the white power, within the white power structure in New York City. The advocates of urban renewal and those who were afraid of the attainment of political power by the African Americans. In 1970, Deputy Chief Charles Kirby fire department made detailed predictions of a forthcoming firestorm in Herman Badillo's power base in the Bronx. I could read you a chilling paragraph, but it's, no, I'm not going to do that. The, the point is that by 1970, the fire department knew there was going to be a firestorm in the South Bronx. If you look at the graph, figure one, you'll see there's a spike between 1967 and 1968 in a fire damage index. That's a sum total of size and number of structural fires in New York City using a statistical technique. Notice it levels off between 1968 and 1972 because the fire service unions sued the city to open 14 fire companies as second sections in existing firehouses. So you had fire engine whatever and fire, fire engine dash two in the high fire incidents of the sections of the Bronx, Harlem, Lower East Side. Those fire companies by number were named in the Kirby Report as essential to holding the line in the Bronx. In 1973, uh, Deputy Chief Charles Jonah did a Kirby Report for the Bushwick section of New York. Fire companies named in those reports were closed. In 1972, 1974, and 1975, before the New York City fiscal crisis. And you can see a sudden spike in the fire damage index. It follow. If you go to figures, figure two, what you see is what happened to him in the deal's voting block between 1970 and 1980. As a consequence of the fire service cuts, a process of contagious urban decay broke out in South Bronx, in Central Harlem, across Bushwick, Brownsville, East New York, and in the parts of the Lower East Side, parts of Queens, the black neighborhoods. Fire companies had been established in the early part of the 20th century in those neighborhoods because there was high fire hazard. These were densely populated neighborhoods. When the minorities moved in and became active politically, those fire companies were pulled out. If you look at figure two, you see that some sections of the South Bronx lost as much as 81% of the housing stock between 1970 and 1980. Figure three shows the migration of welfare population within New York City. Areas that were designated high welfare zones in 1967 and those that were, became high welfare by 1977. What you see is the Bernard Bush of Brownsville, East New York, drove people into Flatbush. The Jewish neighborhoods in Flatbush collapsed and people moved out to the suburbs. The West Bronx, a Jewish neighborhood, collapsed under the, the pressure of forced migration. Figure four shows school transfers, 1974, 1975. What you see 
is the forced migration of school children in the Bronx. That generation of school children from the burning neighborhoods faced such disruption they did not learn to read. Figure five shows the migration in black population between 1970 and 1980. The lightly stippled areas lost black population, the heavily stippled areas gained black population. You can see massive population transfer between 1970 and 1980 as the ghettos were burned down by the withdrawal of essential municipal services We met with the U.S. Attorney's Office for the Southern District in the waiting days of the Carter administration. There was a small task force convened to examine the impact of fire service cuts in New York City. At that meeting, a, an FBI agent had been assigned to this task force from the uh, Civil Rights Division of the, of the Justice Department. It was his professional opinion that the fire service cuts were aimed at dispersing voting blocks. Of course, in 1980, the world changed. Dispersing voting blocks was not a problem. In the South Bronx, the police called it the South Cleaning Oven. If you look at figure one one more time, what you see is a sudden collapse after 1977-1978 in the fire damage index. The areas that had been evacuated by whites living, leaving the city became reoccupied. Housing overcrowded by, by displaced refugees. Housing overcrowding dropped below what is called an epidemiological threshold, and the process stopped. The process of contagious urban decay. Urban renewal in New York displaced approximately 200,000 people. The planned shrinkage, burnout, between 1970 and 1980, displaced 1.2 million. The city, in many respects, has never recovered. All right, two statistics. Between 2000 and 2010, Manhattan Community District 10, which is Central Harlem, gained 8% in population. White people moved in. In the same period, Community District 12, north of 155, lost 9% of its population. There are two minority voting blocks left. The Chinese are actively protected by the PRC. There is an economic interest. It's back and forth. The Dominican voting bloc has challenged Charlie Rangel and others, the remnants of the of the of the, of the Harlem machine. The loss in population in Community Board 12 has been in families with children under 10. Bloomberg wanted to close 20 fire companies, but the city council wouldn't let him. So, as Malcolm X once put it, the names have changed, but the game's the same. The game against the Dominican voting bloc is carried out by withdrawals of other essential municipal services. The police actively, hands on, manage the outdoor drug dealing in the 34th precinct. We have proof of this. We are going to work with the U.S. Attorney's Office again. 
sanitation services are withdrawn from the Dominican voting law. The police do not enforce noise laws in the Dominican voting law. They've gone from a meat axe to a scalpel. But the game's the same. To counter their flexibility, we must engage our own. Toolbox that Martin Luther King gave us is sitting there. It is incumbent upon us to pick up and use those tools. Thanks, Rod. So I have known Rod for many years because my mother, Mindy, has um, often referred to him as her guru. And she and I discussed today that that then makes him all of our guru, so Guru Rod. Um, so now I am Absolutely delighted to introduce our next speaker, who is Havana Fisher. I first met Havana when she was 15 years old, and she was a high school student, born and raised in Harlem, and we worked together to make a documentary about the parks that Mindy showed us in the climb trail. And now she is a recent graduate of Parsons. She studied fashion design, and I have the real pleasure of being able to collaborate with her on a second film. And uh, she's gonna talk, share with us about her lived experience of observing changes in her neighborhood of Harlem. Um, so um, I grew up in like the, well, I was born in 1991, so by the time I came around, um, what was left of Harlem, um, well, you saw before 1990s, uh, we had abandoned buildings and um, we still had some of our own places that, uh, like we used to have our own butcher shop and a few um, businesses that were running at that time. Um, and well, my mom was an activist in the community, and so uh, we grew up, well, I grew up seeing seeds of hope in Harlem. Um, we thought that um, some of these buildings could easily be turned into new opportunities for the people that live there. Um, and uh, construction was something that was necessary and that was needed, and my mother is a union carpenter, so this was a place of interest for her. Um, and she wanted to be one of the people to develop her own neighborhood and also bring others along um, on that train as well so that this was a big opportunity for us to really um, bring um, Harlem back. Um, but um, with a lot of developers coming in, that were, I, I mean, well, we call them foreign because they, they didn't grow up in Harlem, they didn't know anything about Harlem, but Harlem was, a, it was like a land grab. So you had a lot of foreign developers coming in and they had their own plans. And quickly, um, I remember my mom fighting, um, saying that this is going to become one of the worst things ever. And 
and this was the beginning of gentrification as like um, we know it now, but um, then we didn't know how bad it was going to turn out. Um, so some people, we didn't want change in our community because we had a lot of rundown buildings. Um, some schools were falling apart, um, but we wanted it to be um, revitalized for the community's benefit. Um, so there was a lot of pull and a lot of tug um, for some of the resources in that community. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Um, and so we were really kind of being ping-ponged between a state that is obviously racist and kind of like police department that is obviously working along with the state, but the people were being ping-ponged. So there wasn't really a place for us to go and, or to stand on our own. Um, so um, with that, um, tons of things, like tons of changes have happened now and gentrification has happened. Um, it's, not, it's no longer about how to prevent gentrification to ha from happening, it's happened. And it's a, um, it's a reality that's hurtful, but it's a reality that we have to deal with. So moving forward, what can we do now to make sure that gentrification no longer displaces displace the people that live there? Um, one of the things that my mother and I talk about is, well, when you do something, you have to be held accountable for it. So moving forward, how do we hold um, our, our city accountable for what they've done? Um, and um, I guess that's the question that moving forward that we're going to have to deal with, um, as well as trying to um, save the people that are still living there. And I also want to like put out there that at the rate of people going to prison, um, a lot of young, a lot of mothers are losing being evicted from their homes. So this is really like a. A, I would say a stable attack on a community um, and what happens when you attack a community or what I see in gentrification is you're attacking the root of a, a, a strong movement that could happen um, as we saw I haven't seen the movie Selma yet but um, what I've learned um, without the movie is that it was a strong grassroots organization that was happening and it was with people and communities coming together. Um, but with gentrification, what makes gentrification so lethal is that it attacks that base and it, it really disrupts it. So people really, they, they're um, separated from one another. Um, so that support system in order to come together is literally being broken down. So gentrification is one tool to make sure that people can't mobilize. Um, it's, it's almost, it makes it very impossible. I mean, if you have a living condition that is not okay, um, that's where you come home to, that's where you re um, regroup. Um, so if that's being torn apart, you're literally being uprooted from the ground. Um, and not to say that, you know, you go to work, and of course people go to work, and like my mom, she was a union carpenter, so she was battling that, being one of the only female black um, fe um, carpenters in the union, they were very, very evil towards her. So she was fighting on two fronts. So, but that much terrible of a job that you have to do as an individual to fight. Um, so I think that gentrification is something that is used as a tool against people and we have to realize that this isn't just some thing of people being removed or just like the place and we're just like fixing up these homes to just turn them into I don't know like cafe stores as if we didn't have places already I saw coffee that was even better um, than what we have now I mean it's cute but I miss the old spots. Um, a lot of, um, just something as simple, um, a lot of our heritage is gone. There was an old restaurant called 22 West and this restaurant was um, very important, to me at least, because it was, um, um, Malcolm X would go there every Sunday and have his dinner. And I remember as a child going there and sitting in the same booth. Um, and that's important, that's legacy that has been snatched. Um, 
And now children will never experience that. And it's important because it's important because you automatically have a direct lineage to something that is so strong and it gives you hope. And like I said, a lot of these buildings, they were broken down, but we imagined that they would become something for us. And they, they became something that we would never even be able to, to even look at. Some, some um, homes that um, got renovated, I knew people that lived there, and um, they had to leave New York City because they couldn't afford to stay here at all. Um, so they never even got a chance to see it be reformed to, and maybe that's a blessing in disguise because I think that it would hurt that much more to see your home reformed into something that you could never obtain. And so it's very violent um, and it is just definitely like just a removal of not just you as a people but you as a human being, your humanity and everything is up for sale. Um, so, um, if I could just leave you guys with something, it, it is to think of gentrification as like a violent attack. Um, you know, I you know the South had Jim Crow, but you know the North had a whole lot of things like urban renewal and gentrification. Um, and this is our Jim Crow um, because it definitely separates people and then disperses them to wherever. I mean, most of the people I knew that had to leave, they had to pick, pick up whatever finances they could find to leave. They weren't even replaced or placed somewhere else. They were literally just kicked out. And some people and became homeless, families. I wouldn't say families, because these just aren't just people. These are families with children, mothers with children um, that got displaced. And, and those are the ones that were, um, I guess, they were um, more vulnerable, but those were the ones that took the hit, was um, mothers, single mothers and children. These are people that we're discussing here in terms of being removed. So you had a lot of men being thrown in prison, but then people that were being kicked out were children um, and their mothers. Um, and these are, I think, in my opinion, the most vulnerable people in our society that we seem to treat the worst, so. So if people have questions or just want to share. Um, well, this is a general question, I guess. Cause I mean, it's something that I, um, I probably ask myself and other people that we're trying to address, address this issue here in Jackson Heights and Corona, but um, I just don't know. Um, and maybe in other neighborhoods as well, there's another group like this um, trying to, um, asking this, this question, um, and it will be, um, what are the alternatives um, for this uh, gentrification? I know, the city um, implements like um, business improvement districts, but um, I don't think that's like the, um, the solution for a neighborhood. So I don't know, that's just a general question and it's something to think about. You know, part of the alternative, it, it, you can't think about this small, I think. I think that's where we get trapped. Is, we say, oh, there's a housing problem. It's not a housing problem. 
we have a human rights problem. And if we start to think about it as a human rights problem, we're going to have a big enough conversation. And I, I really deeply agree with Rod that um, it's, uh, you know, it, it's just really essential to think about the, the larger strategies and tactics of nonviolence. And because nonviolence can, can, we have to bring it to a halt, what's going on. And we, we can use nonviolence to do that. <clears throat> and so we have to, if, if you think about what Rod was saying about the movements that move forward and they have success, and then what Havana was saying, when you have gentrification or urban renewal or planned shrinkage and you tear apart the community, then people are just confused and they lose momentum. So that's the problem. How do we, we have to rebuild the movements. We can't keep rebuilding movements. We have to stop the displacement. So I, we have to reframe it. It's not a housing question. It's really a human survival question. Hi, Havana. I really commend you for connecting the reality um, on the ground. My question is, in your experience, or anyone on the panel here, with the community development corporations, like Abyssinian, because they were sort of the first who represent the face of the community and sort of create this pipeline of development to come into places like Harlem. What has been the pushback or the platform to hold such organizations accountable for what they have done? When the Germans would move in World War II, when the Germans would move into a city, Eastern Europe, they'd surround the ghetto. They would appoint what they called the Judenrat, the Jewish council for that ghetto. It was the responsibility of that council to deliver Jews to the concentration camps, to identify Everybody, everybody who does that sort of thing finds a Judenrat. It didn't just happen, it doesn't just happen in Eastern Europe. In its way, it happens here, it happens now. Bringing such people to account I mean, there, is, there are traditions, again, there are traditions within the black church, there are traditions in, the American, in American history that allow us to see those things for what they are and to move forward from them, to learn from them. We have to learn from what people, the, the leadership did in Central Harlem and ensure that it doesn't happen elsewhere. That's a hard thing. Well, um, there has been pushback against a lot of, um, well, that development corporation in particular. So, I mean, I think that um, within the community there is definitely this pull between people who, um, know that, the, or feel that these, we know who our friends are and who are not our friends. And I think that um, Harlem, people of Harlem are definitely learning that. Like, if you talk to any Harlem residents, you know, or like not any, because some people still go along, but you will get some really harsh things said. Um, about a lot of these corporations because they know and they know that they were cheated. So definitely I don't think that people are just going along with the get along. Um, but it's it's about um, how do we, I guess, some people and a lot of even other churches, even some churches are organizing to kind of dethrone them. Um, is So it's, it's really a thing about as well as fighting um, we also have to kind of fight our own, and but that's definitely something that's happening, um, and has to happen in order for us to move forward. So, it's two fights going on. Uh, 
Hi, my name is Denise. Um, my question is directed towards anyone. Uh, how do you feel the climate justice movement plays a role in gentrification? <laughs> there, of course, is a spectrum of issues. Within the United States, if you go back to the bones of the nation, it's written in the Constitution that a slave is to be counted as three-fifths of a man. It's deep. And in many ways, that history colors a great deal of our politics. And I think one has to view that strain in, in America as a separate thing. And it has to be put on the table. It is so fundamental to the functioning of the country that I think every group that considers itself progressive has to put that on its table, on its agenda. And for many uh, progressive groups, that's a hard thing to do because the, you just don't see, your, your blind spot is, is just so big. When you do what should be a progressive thing, you don't see these other things. There are uh, the people who will suffer most from environmental degradation and climate change, are the people who have been suffering the most for 250 years. Hi, um, my name is Milton. First, I just want to say thank you for uh, having for sharing your story. Um, it's I, I know how exactly sometimes how you feel. It's when you I lived and I came when I was 15 years old to Corona um, and I, from from South America. So I kind of grew up in the neighborhood um, and uh, you know like right next to my building. It was like close to the project. Um, you know we, were, we we grew up like five people living in the studio. And uh, one day, uh, there was an abandoned building right next to us uh, in the corner, 112 and 37 Ave. Um, and it was abandoned for, for many years. And just one day, there was this hotel that was just constructed there, very luxurious and everything, um, to the point where my mom, the idea of having like a great fancy New Year's Eve was to like go next door to this hotel to have dinner there. That was very nice. Um, and now I, I hear plans that they, they, they want to construct a, a convention center around here. And it's, you know, like, it's, it's this kind of thing where you see those abandoned buildings and you think about, okay, what can they do, you know, maybe there's more housing that they're going to construct. Like you, you make up ideas in your own mind because of the stuff that you see that you need, that's, that, you, that you need and that the people around you need. And all of a sudden you see what's really constructed there, what's really developed is something that, you know, no one needs. No one finds any use for it, but you know, a convention center, for example, right smack in the middle of you know projects and and and, and, and parks and an, an actual neighborhood, basically spells decimation of that whole neighborhood, you know. Um, so that stuff is happening right now here, and it, it like it really hurt me when you you know, I when you said not in the sense that you said something that hurt me, but your experience um, uh, resonated with me when you said you know we lost we lost Harlem when you say that. Uh, the fact that I, I don't want to see myself in five years saying we lost Corona or in ten years saying we lost Corona. Um, in 2009 I started working in Harlem. Um, I have a point here, I'm, I'm getting to it. <laughs> I started working in Harlem because of the fact that many, op many restaurants started opening up in Broadway. Uh, in like around 150th, like 125th and above. Um, and this was like the beginning of, you know, the hyper gentrification when Colombia basically started acquiring all, the, all, those, all those buildings and, and the plans for the condos in Riverside, um, you know, started being, becoming, uh, they became public knowledge, basically. So I started working in a restaurant, um, and from 2009 to 2011, the change was just so drastic. Like, it's changed that you didn't see in a decade before. 
in a sense. Um, for, you know, the, the restaurant where I worked was opened by a local business owner. And, uh, and then now he has to compete with people who <laughs> inject, you know, like $3 million on a business right there and then. And for restaurants that are clearly not for the community that's there then, uh, at that point in time, but it's clearly catering for people who are gonna come from somewhere else. And it's unspoken, as you guys say, you know, it's unspoken who is that they want to come, who is that they're catering to, you know, from the food to the, you know, to the, the cuteness of it, let's say. Um, I started working there now again in a restaurant that's close by again. Uh, and it's, just, it's a little sad how, 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 how things have changed. Uh, my question here is basically like a person who, I come from this neighborhood in Corona in Jackson Heights. And, uh, and, you know, and I, for example, I find work over there in Harlem in these places that are being gentrified. Um, you know, and I try to think about my own neighborhood and how I can help it, uh, you know, um, help this stop. And I try to think of it as a human rights issue, but at the same time, it's very difficult to connect those two struggles in the city. So my, my question would be like, what's the best way of thinking, like a practical way? I know it's, it's, it's great to say like, let's get together or anything, but what's a practical way of connecting those two, you know, people from the neighborhood who have lost the neighborhood, let's say, to people from the neighborhood who are in the process of losing it? One of the great things about this 596 acres effort here at, the, at this museum is that there's this panorama of the city, and how often do you actually get to see the whole city at your feet? You feel very powerful, right? Right. Like you could run the whole thing. Um, the, I, I think that it's really fundamentally important that people begin to have the whole city in mind, and that we begin to think in terms of all the neighborhoods. There's no neighborhood that's unaffected by this merry-go-round that we're on. You know, it's a, it's a game of musical chairs and we're all playing it. And musical chairs is the worst game. If you just really want to ruin a children's party, you tell them to play musical chairs, right? And, and they're all crying inside of three minutes. Who wants to play that game? We, we just need a new game. But there's a problem of all of us. And, and, you know, so I think one of the things that's important is that going forth from here, you know, Paula and 596 Acres and so many other organizations just have to figure out how, how we're all going to get together. Because there are, there are groups in every neighborhood that are organizing. And how are we all going to get together?